Welcome to this video series about private equity net returns, where we talk about how you can calculate a portfolio's net IRR by just clicking a few buttons on a calculator. My name is Mike Reiner and I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run the Auxilia Mathematica website and I wrote the book Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. This is the fourth video in the Private Equity Net Return series where I show you better ways to calculate net returns for private equity track records that don't have real net returns because they're not real private equity funds. At the end of the last video, I said that we can calculate net IRRs, or at least very good approximations of net IRRs, without cash flow spreadsheets. It'll just take me a few minutes to show you how to do that, and then we'll spend the rest of the video explaining why it works. Here's a portfolio we used in the last two videos. Let's pretend that we don't have access to the underlying cash flow data. We know the management fees and fund expenses add up to 25 million, but other than that, all we have is this table. First, we calculate the portfolio's fee and expense multiplier. As we discussed last time, that's 1 plus 25 over gross invested capital 180. This gives us an F&E multiplier of 1.139x. Then we calculate the portfolio's carried interest multiplier. It's an ugly formula, but there's only three variables. The carry rate, which is usually 20%, the F&E multiplier, and the gross multiple of invested capital. When we plug these in, we get a carry multiplier of 1.073x. Then we calculate the portfolio's net multiple by dividing the gross multiple by the F&E and carry multipliers. This gives us a net multiple of invested capital of 1.410x. Great, now let's assume that the fees, expenses, and carry are pooled in this portfolio because that's how they work for most private equity funds. This means that we can apply the portfolio's F&E and carry multipliers to every row on the table as follows. And this lets us calculate a net multiple for each deal in each group of deals on this table. Now, at this point in the last video, we went over to the portfolio's cash flow spreadsheet and applied our multipliers to the inflows and the outflows. But this time we don't have a cash flow spreadsheet, so what are we going to do? Well, first, let us recognize that IRRs are a lot like compounded annual growth rates. The Kager formula is a multiple, like x2 over x1, raised to the power of 1 over a holding period, delta t, all minus 1. Let's assume that we can model a net IRR in the same way. This would be the net multiple of invested capital, which we already have, raised to the power of 1 over delta t, minus 1. Now, it would be tempting to use each investment's holding period as a proxy for each delta t, because we could calculate that from the entry and exit dates on the table. But this will give us the wrong answer most of the time. That's why we put an apostrophe after delta t. It's not a holding period, but an effective holding period. The equation for the effective hold is the natural log of the gross multiple of invested capital divided by the natural log of 1 plus the gross IRR. That looks kind of weird, right? Well, let's see how it works by calculating it for the entire portfolio. Here we have a gross multiple of 1.722x and a gross IRR of 19.92%. So we take the natural log of 1.722 over the natural log of 1.1992, which gives us an effective hold of 2.99 years. We know that the portfolio has a net multiple of invested capital of 1.410x, so to calculate its net IRR, we raise 1.41 to the power of 1 over 2.99 years and then subtract 1. This gives us an effective net IRR of 12.16%, a number that is nearly identical to the net IRR calculated from the cash flow driven better net return model that we discussed in the last video. Now, the great thing about this approach is that the columns on the standard gross return table, like this one, they give us everything we need to calculate our net IRRs. The 11 gross multiples and 11 gross IRRs give us 11 effective holds and we can apply these to the 11 net multiples to calculate 11 net IRRs. These numbers are very close to those that we calculated in the last video, and as promised, we got them without ever touching a cash flow spreadsheet. Now, just like last time, we can easily switch this over to a deal by deal carry model. Rather than using the pooled carry multiplier of 1.073x, we calculate the multiple for each row independently using each deal's gross multiple. This gives us the deal by deal carry multipliers, which gives us the deal by deal net multiples, which gives us the deal by deal net IRRs. Piece of cake. Now, I said that you could find these IRRs with a handheld calculator. So let's see how Cyber Stacy would do that using this formula and the numbers on the table for Echo Company. The F&E multiplier is 1 plus 25 over 180, 1.139. For the carry multiplier, we can take a little shortcut. Whenever a gross multiple is smaller than the fee multiplier, the carry multiplier is always 1. We see this with BravoCo, 
Hotel Co. and Delta Co. in the table. Otherwise, the carry multiplier is greater than 1, and we could ignore the max part of the function. So for Echo Company, the carry multiplier is 1 over 0.8 plus 0.2 times 1.139 divided by 3, which gives us 1.142. The net multiple is 3 divided by these two multipliers, or 2.306x, which we see matches Echo Company's net multiple on the table. Now raise this to the power of log 1.5522 over log 3, and we get 1.397. Subtract 1, and we have 0.397, or 39.7%, which matches Echo Company's net IRR on the table. Now this is Echo Company's deal-by-deal -deal net IRR to see its pooled IRR. We simply replace its deal-by-deal -deal carry multiplier by the portfolio's carry multiplier of 1.073. This makes the net multiple a bit higher at 2.455. Raise this to the power of 1 over Echo Company's effective hold again, and we get 1.432. Subtract 1, and we get a net IRR of 43.2%. We see that this net multiple and this net IRR match the net returns on the table for the pooled carried interest model. So that's how it works. If that's all you care about, congratulations, class is dismissed. Head over to the website where you can download the Excel template and get to work building your own models. For those of you that would like to see evidence that this is just as valid as any other cash flow driven IRR model, stick around. We'll do that for the rest of the video. First, let's look at this effective holding period formula so we can see how the natural logarithms come into the picture. Well, it starts with a gross multiple and gross IRR. When we plug them into the Kager formula, we're inferring some kind of relationship between the gross IRR, which depends on time, and the gross multiple, which is independent of time. We know that these are both real numbers. Somewhere there's a cash flow spreadsheet that supports them, even if we don't have access to it. So the effective hold must also be some kind of real and meaningful number that connects the two of them. Let's solve for it with a bit of high school math. First, we move the 1 to the IRR side of the equation and take the natural logarithm of both sides. A unique feature of natural logarithms is that log of x to the a equals a times log x. So we could use that here to bring the 1 over delta t prime exponent out front. After that, we can rearrange things a bit to prove that delta t prime is equal to the natural log of the gross multiple divided by the natural log of 1 plus the gross IRR. Okay, the math is clear, but what does it mean? Well, first, the effective hold is a measurement of time. Its units are in years because it comes from the IRR, which is an annualized return measurement. It represents what I call a dollar-weighted duration. So it's a holding period that's adjusted for the timing of all the inflows and outflows that occur during the hold. And it'll work for any deal that has a positive or negative return, but unfortunately not when gross IRR is 0%. That makes the argument within the natural logarithm go to 1, which makes the denominator go to 0, which makes the formula blow up at that point. When this happens, we either need to nudge evaluation up or down a bit, or swap out the effective holding period with an actual holding period if that's all we have. Okay, that's the theoretical part. I think it makes more sense if we look at some examples. Here's a set of 10 different cash flow scenarios. They all have four things in common. In every case, we invest 10, return 20, have a 2x multiple of invested capital, and a four-year holding period. However, the timing of all the cash flows is different, so they have different IRRs and different effective holds. Let's start with the alpha scenario. This is the one where all the capital is invested on the first day of the hold, and all the capital is returned on the last day of the hold. The first thing I notice is that the effective hold is equal to the actual hold of four years. This only happens in deals where there's a single inflow and a single outflow. In these deals, the IRR calculation is no different than a Kegger calculation, so the effective holding period converges to the actual holding period. The other thing we notice is that alpha is the scenario with the worst IRR. The IRRs in every other scenario are higher. That's because they were able to achieve their 2x return while having less capital at risk or in play during the holding period. While every scenario ultimately invested 10 and returned 20, the latter were able to do it while investing less capital up front or taking chips off the table earlier. We can see that as a pattern as we move from left to right. The IRRs are going up at the bottom of the table because the capital is being deployed more efficiently at the top of the table. They are either investing capital more slowly or returning it more quickly. And this gets reflected down here in the effective holding period. The number gets lower as we move from left to right because there's less capital at risk or in play during the hold. The IRR and the effective hold are inversely correlated. Now, one way to look at the effective hold is as a dollar-weighted average. For example, in scenario delta, they invest five initially and then another five two years later. So the first five has a holding period of four years, and the second five has a holding period of two years, 
From an invested capital perspective, it has a dollar weighted average holding period of three years, which is pretty close to the effective hold of 3.11 below. This is similar to scenario Echo. Here they return 10 after two years and another 10 after four years. So from a return to capital perspective, they also have a dollar weighted average holding period of three years. And this is pretty close to the effective hold of 2.88 years below. The last scenario is pretty interesting as well. They double their money in their first year, take two years off, and then in the final year, they double their money on another investment. Whenever you double your money in a year, that's a 100% IRR. The fact that they did that twice over the holding period doesn't change things. They still have an IRR of 100%, and the Delta T prime formula reads that as a one year effective holding period. So that's how the effective hold formula works for individual deals. But I think that the power of the approach is most evident when we are looking at portfolios that have many inflows and outflows. Here is the gross cash flow series that we've been working off of for the last three episodes. Over a period of six years, we have 20 different inflows and outflows. I'm not even sure how you would calculate a weighted average holding period for something like this, but with the effective hold, it's easy. Take the natural log of the gross multiple, 1.722x, divided by the natural log of 1 plus the gross IRR of 19.92%, this gives us an effective hold of 2.99 years. Or to be more specific, 2.992708.53 years, which is 2 years, 11 months, 26 days, 8 hours, and 7 minutes. When we use the effective holding period, we're basically taking all 20 of these portfolio cash flows and condensing them into one inflow and one outflow with the effective holding period in between them. So instead of nine investments between December 2016 and June 2020, we get one inflow of 180 million occurring on the morning of July 3rd, 2018. Instead of 11 distributions in fair market values between December 2018 and December 2022, we get one outflow of 310 million occurring on the afternoon of June 29th, 2021. This gives us the same gross multiple of 1.722x, and when we plug them into an XIRR formula, we get the same 19.92% gross IRR that we got from the 20 cash flow model above. What's happening here is that the effective hold mathematics take a scenario with many cash flows and reduces it to a scenario with only two cash flows separated by that effective hold. This allows us to solve the IRR with a Kager formula, because when you only have two cash flows, Kagers and IRRs are equal. Now, when we use this method to calculate a net IRR, what we're doing is adjusting the size of these two cash flows below. So we use the F&E multiplier to increase invested capital from 180 to 205, and then we use the carry multiplier to reduce the return from 310 to 289. 289 over 205 gives us the net multiple of 1.410, and plugging these cash flows into an XIRR formula gives us a net IRR of 12.16%. Now, what's great about this is we don't need a cash flow spreadsheet and we don't need the XIRR formula. In the first part of this video, we are able to get the exact same net multiple and net IRR without the cash flows. In fact, using this formula right here, we were able to calculate a net multiple and net IRR for every deal on the table without knowing or needing to know when any of the inflows or outflows happened. So considering this model allows us to calculate better net IRRs faster, more easily, using less data, don't you think that everyone should be using it? Well, it is not without its drawbacks, and the biggest one, I think, is having to explain how it works and why it works to those who have never seen it before. The footnote for the effective net return model would look something like this. The first part isn't so bad, but the second part, wow. Imagine trying to explain that to a skeptical regulator during an SEC examination. We're using natural logarithms to reverse engineer a holding period so that we can calculate a net IRR like a kegger. I can already see their eyes glazing over as they think about how they're going to punish you for making them suffer the indignity of remembering that log A to the X equals A log X. So I think it'll take some time to convince the industry that an effective net IRR can be just as meaningful or better than other hypothetical net IRRs that get cooked up with traditional cash flow models. Not everyone will be willing to sit through 15 minutes of spreadsheets and math like you just did watching this video. That's why our avatar for the effective net IRR model CyberStacy comes from the future. It may take some time before the industry is ready for it. So let's wrap this up with a comparison of the three private equity net return models that we discussed in this and the last two videos. For each one, we'll assume that you need to build a model that supports about a dozen hypothetical net IRRs, and we'll also assume that the SEC is coming in to do an on-site examination next week, so you'll have to explain this model to them. The conventional net return model that we discussed in video 102 has the benefit that its cash flows look most like real fund cash flows. 
We're just adding fees and expenses and subtracting carry at various times. But this makes the net IRRs less reliable because they're easily manipulated and the models don't scale very well. Every net IRR requires a separate cash flow spreadsheet with its own set of assumptions and detailed footnotes that explain each deduction for management fees, fund expenses, and carried interest. For the 12 net IRRs, you probably spend five or six hours building models and writing footnotes. Even though it's the easiest model to conceptually explain, this can take some time because there's so many different iterations with different theoretical fund sizes and assumptions, so I'll put explanation time at one or two hours. The better net return model that we discussed in video 103 is a bit less intuitive than the conventional model, but not terribly so. We're still making cash flow deductions for fees, expenses, and carry, but we're doing them systematically. That makes the IRRs more robust and less susceptible to manipulation. And it makes the models very scalable. We can calculate 12 IRRs on a single spreadsheet with a single set of assumptions. A model could be built in less than one or two hours, and it's relatively easy to explain. We're just making the inflows more negative to account for fees and expenses and making the outflows less positive to account for carried interest. So I'll put explanation time at about 30 minutes. Now, the effective net return model has the distinct disadvantage that it looks like it comes from outer space. Other than that, it's the best in every way. Systematic fee, expense, and carry deductions, basically manipulation-proof, and incredibly scalable. You can do the entire net IRR calculation with a single formula in a spreadsheet cell, so you could calculate a thousand net IRRs on a single spreadsheet. You can build the model in only about 10 minutes, but all that time you saved will probably get reinvested in justifying why it works to your limited partners, lawyers, and the SEC, so I'm going to put the explanation time in about two or three hours. So in the end, I'd say that the conventional model is best if you don't like learning new things, you're a masochist who enjoys spending way too much time in Microsoft Excel, or you dislike your analyst and you want them to work all weekend. The better net return model is probably your best bet if you expect to be fundraising, and you need something that's relatively easy to update and also relatively easy to explain. I think that the effective net IRR model at this point is best for those who want to calculate many net IRRs but don't need to use them for marketing purposes, so for limited partners or GPs who just want to spot check their returns. If you try to use this model to raise a fund, be prepared for some pretty intense mathematical discussions with your limited partners, lawyers, and regulators. So this officially wraps up the four main videos in the private equity net return series covering the three main net return models. I will add a couple more videos of this series, but they'll be more tactical and cover smaller topics like where are the best place to get your fee and expense numbers or how to set up your spreadsheets so that they don't break every quarter when you need to update them. Well, if you made it this far, thanks for sticking around. As always, make sure to check out the episode page for this video on the website. There you'll find notes, references, and Excel templates for all the models that you can download. If you need more help getting up to speed on these net return models, please do feel free to get in touch. Thanks for watching and see you next time.